This is an extraordinary interview. I recorded it earlier because of the time difference. It's graphic in parts. You mightn't want the kids to hear it, but it is crucially important that we do hear it for what's happening in the world. Charles Miranda is the News Limited European editor. He's in Donetsk near the crash site. A couple of hours ago, he was lucky not to be killed. Missile attacks resumed by the Ukrainians. Now, the UN says stop shooting. Well, they haven't. It's continuing. Charles' reports are in the Herald Sun. I did speak to him a short while ago. I suggested it sounded from his experiences in the past few hours as if the war was certainly back. Yeah, absolutely. Look, just um, moments after the uh, the bodies in their refrigerated trains uh, left uh, Torres and uh, headed up towards Kharkiv, which is a safe territory of uh, Ukraine, uh, two jets flew over and fired missiles um, at a, a very famous memorial that's very uh, passionate to the people of this area. It's a World War II memorial uh, and just blew the whole thing up. And this was the Ukraine uh, Air Force. Uh, there's mortars going off now in uh, Donetsk uh, very indiscriminately. Uh, we had to take shelter in a, in a basement of a, of a home unit as all around us uh, bombs were falling. I mean, this is a suburban area. There's a, there's a tank going past just now. Um, uh, there's armoured personnel carriers. There's convoys. I mean, it's all, it's all happening here at the moment. And why is this happening? Is this related to MH17, do you think, or is it just the war resuming? It's very much the war resuming. I, I think the uh, the Ukrainians decided they wanted to take the uh, the initiative, while the, um, uh, the, the 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 militia were sort of you know still ushering the bodies out and still looking at the crash site and all the rest of it. Um, and they, uh, I think the Ukrainian uh, thought, well, we can take advantage of this. They're uh, they're distracted. Let's continue the uh, the war. Now there's been a lot of death here over the last uh, few weeks on both sides. And uh, I think this is very much uh, business as usual now. It's all back to, uh, back to normal on the war footing. Where were you when this was happening? Uh, I was in the square, unfortunately. I was the first, uh, the first person to come across uh, uh, four civilian bodies. Um, it was a, a very nice park, uh, a beautiful park, in fact. And there was a lady. And uh, on any other day, you think, oh, she's just lying out on the grass having a nice time. Um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, the bombs walked off. She was walking across the square. The mortars started dropping. Um, uh, we left the basement of a, of a flat. We just ran into the first basement we found. They've all got basements here uh, on the outside of the flats. Uh, we walked out, and, and there she is, just lying in the park. And uh, obviously, um, she uh, no longer had a head, uh, this poor lady. Uh, and uh, further along down the road, another two men uh, were there. All the trees have parted uh, where the missiles came through. Um, it was uh, it was terribly distressing, you know. And we walked into another basement. There's 70 children below ground, cowering. A lot of them were used to it. Um, it's school holidays here at the moment, but these were just children. They uh, that adults gathered up uh, from the area and, and ushered them in here, just randoms. Anyone who was around, everyone get in. Um, we ran across a field at one stage because uh, the windows on uh, on the tower blocks started. Uh, uh, exploding from uh, from the shock waves and uh, showers of glass everywhere. So uh, we ran across the field. As we were running, I saw a piece of metal sticking out of the ground, and uh, yeah, the uh, the local I was running with uh, said it was very much uh, very much a um, a shell that just hadn't gone off, and that's a, a fairly regular occurrence. The shells fall; they have been dead in the ground, but they're still alive. Um, and so he just yelled to me to just run a little faster because it could go off at any time. Good grief. So it was a harrowing day, uh, more so for the locals, I think, though, caught very much uh, off guard. And again, this was just a an area. And uh, Donetsk is uh, like any city uh, in Australia, you know, it's got beautiful gardens, it's, it's manicured, it's landscaped. It just happens to be the uh, the stronghold for the um, for the separatist movement. Um, but the people here are normal people um, uh, who are having to put up with uh, two armies <laughs> fighting a civil war in their backyard, as it were. And has that settled down in the past few hours? Uh, funnily enough, it's actually started again. So um, all the tanks are on the move uh, literally in the last hour. Uh, in the distance, um, on the, uh, the east side of the city, uh, there, are, there are flares going off. Um, so there's some action, uh, some action happening, uh, happening there. Um, what they do have, though, is they have martial law here. So uh, in about, uh, looking at my watch now, in about um, uh, an hour or so, actually, no, in about seven minutes or so, I should say, uh, martial law gets imposed so that no one can be on the streets and the militia are very strict about that. Some taxis can still operate with a special licence, but otherwise everything has to close. Everyone's off on the street 
uh, and that's it for the night. So, um, again, uh, there could be more action once that happens. Will this affect the recovery or any of the work around the, the site of MH17? Uh, we will know that in about um, in about three hours. Um, the, uh, the the bodies were all being repatriated, as you know, in those uh, refrigerated uh, trains. They're on their way now to Kharkiv, uh, which is a large city in eastern Ukraine, but is very much um, in uh, pro Kiev mode, so it's very much Western. Um, but you know, they're blowing up the train lines. So the train line and train station here in Donetsk uh, uh, has been blown up. Now the train has. has bypass this city. We don't know how much further along the line um, uh, that train could encounter uh, problems and whether the rails are going to be dug up there as well. So the train's on its way. In about three hours, it should arrive in that city, but we just uh, we just don't know. I mean, all the roads here are now shut down outside of the city. There are roadblocks everywhere, and uh, they're being heavily enforced. Everyone's having to show passports. Um, we have to, as foreigners, get special um, uh, permits from the uh, self-styled uh, People Republic um, and we have to apply for those. They have to interview us. It's a bit of a, um, a bit of a process. Uh, but, you know, they still do. They search our cars. Uh, you know, we hide laptops and anything else uh, just in case they get uh, seized and confiscated, etc. cetera. Um, yeah, who knows what's going to happen in the next uh, 48 hours. But once those bodies are out of this zone and all the uh, inspectors are out of the zone, I think it's, uh, it's very much uh, business as usual, back to war stakes. The Prime Minister's described what's happening there as shambolic. He did that yesterday. You agree? Uh, absolutely, without a doubt. He also described it as uh, akin to a, a garden clean-up and not a forensic investigation, I believe. And uh, yeah. that was a very apt description. As I read that, I thought... You know what? That's exactly what it is. But, um, Neil, I can tell you, um, I went out to uh, a crash site. Uh, uh, there's various crash sites. We're talking, I don't know what the latest figure is. They're talking about a 50-square-kilometre um, uh, area of crash sites. But I went to one of the main crash sites, uh, and I found uh, a passport just lying there. Uh, and it happens to be the captain's passport. Now, there was a local policeman there, so I pointed it to him and said, there we are, buddy. There's a passport for you to pick up. Uh, it was the captain's passport, and near that passport was also the plane's logbooks were sitting right there. And just uh, further along from that were the uh, flight path charts. I mean, this Good stuff breath. is all sitting out there. There is no one around. There was no one around. I was there. Uh, a local policeman was there um, uh, for this village, and that was about it, and a few locals milling around and all the rest of it. But, I mean, this is, you would think this is important stuff. This is important documents. Um, and I can tell you now, Neil, it's actually started to rain. Uh, so those documents, uh, if they weren't picked up by, uh, by this uh, lonely old uh, Bobby, um, then, you know, they're, they're going to get very, uh, very wet, very sodden. And, um, you know, these investigators have lost some, uh, some vital piece of evidence, I would suggest. So, Charles, is this incompetence or is it a deliberate uh, attempt to cover something up, do you think? No, I think probably incompetence. Um, I, I think would be uh, would be giving him too much credit to uh, to suggest it's anything more than that, or it's some sort of Machiavellian plot. Uh, you're, these people, these militias, and um, uh, you know, I've spent a bit of time with them now, and you get talking to them. They're pretty simple folk. You know, the guy I spoke to today, who was the the, the chief border guard, he's a dairy farmer. Another guy I spoke to um, uh, was a graduate uh, of psychology at university. He only graduated uh, uh, late last year, um, and that's and now he's uh, he's carrying uh, this uh, Kalishnikov. You know, these people. This is what they do. They were just simple locals had other jobs. Now they're all arming themselves up because um, they're part of the militia group that wants to take over the city, wants to break away from uh, from Ukraine. Do they care about this plane? Well, no, because as far as they're concerned, it was a Ukrainian jet that was tailing the airline and blew it out of the sky. And now they will tell you that with absolute conviction. They're not trying to convince you of that. This is actually what they believe. They absolutely believe that these things, uh, that, that this, these uh, Ukrainian jets shot this uh, passenger airline out of the sky uh, to involve the rest of the world in their conflict. How are they coping with it? I mean, you have a report in the Herald Sun today about a woman who's had a, a body has just crashed through the roof of her house into her lounge room. How are they coping? Look, that was... Uh, she was quite distressed, and she, she did... Um, uh, you know, she was very resolute at the start... Uh, but as soon as I pointed out that there was blood um, still caking her uh, her pots and pans in this little kitchen, um, she uh, she started to cry. I mean, these people are used to it. Uh, there are there are bombs falling all the time and have been for uh, for several months. 
um, and particularly in these outlying areas. Why they're bombing farmyards, I don't know, um, because there's nothing else out there. Uh, uh, yeah, probably incompetence on that point as well. But she, she was kind of used to it. But then, I mean, these are harrowing scenes. You know, uh, her neighbour found a, a nine-month-old baby, uh, which was terribly distressing. There was an orphanage uh, two doors down from that house. They were having a garden party uh, at the time that uh, MH17 was shut out of the sky. They were having a garden party and they looked up, they heard the explosion, looked up, and uh, speaking to one of the children there, they said, big blackbirds are falling out of the sky. And that's what they thought they were. And then next, you know, within seconds, um, falling at a rapid rate from 10,000 feet, there were bodies everywhere. 39 bodies fell on a hamlet of a dozen houses. Um, uh, and now that is terribly distressing. And these bodies, and I don't want to get too graphic for, for your listeners, but you can imagine they're falling from a, from a very great height. Charles, do you feel in danger? I'm feeling a, a little exposed. I feel very exposed um, uh, today, I have to say. Um, yeah, and I, I didn't bring my kit with me because I was on, on an unrelated assignment. So I've come here sans, uh, sans bulletproof vest. But um, yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know how I'm going to get out of uh, Donetsk at this stage because um, there is no uh, airport. Uh, the bus station was blown up today. Uh, the rail line's been cut. Uh, so all of a sudden you're thinking, well, gee, I'll, hang up, I'll have to get a car. Now you've got to pay someone that's going to actually want to do that drive in the first instance. And then in the second instance, um, you know, you don't know what's happening on the road. And it's about a 10-hour uh, a journey on the road. And there's a lot between, uh, between here and, uh, and Kiev. So uh, do you take that risk? I don't know. It's well, a bit of a gamble. You're a brave man. You're doing a superb job. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, appreciate that. Thanks very much, Neil. All the best. Charles Miranda, News Limited man on the spot. Uh, his reports in detail on the Herald Sun today. Brave man, Charles Miranda, and you take my point. The, the UN says end the violence and protect the site. The violence continues and the site, the integrity of the site is gone.